We're on the record. Thank you. Okay. Uh, welcome to the appellate court mor morning session, March 9th, 10.30 a.m. appeal. The uh, appeal is Finley v. Western Express at Al, which would include National Casualty Company, I believe. I would ask that everyone participating in the hearing identify themselves, starting with the judges, then counsel for the appellant, and then counsel for the appellate. I am Judge Alport. I'm Judge Prescott. I'm Judge Suarez. Good morning. I'm Keith Courier for the uh, plaintiff appellant, Montavious Finley. Good morning. I'm Richard Bowerman for Appley Western Express and National Casualty Company. Okay, thank you. Counsel, prior to this argument, you received procedural instructions for this hearing. Are there any questions before we begin? No, Your Honor. I have none, Your Honor. Okay. Uh, I just want to remind you that all of our arguments are now being live streamed on YouTube. Uh, if the case involves any protected information, uh, that should not be disclosed. Please be reminded to be careful not to disclose that information uh, during arguments. Uh, and we will, as judges, keep that in mind when asking questions. Uh, okay. Uh, does the when uh, at the time the appellant introduces himself, and that would uh, be you, Attorney Courier, you can let me know how much time you'd like to reserve from your 20 minutes on rebuttal, and I'll keep track of that on this using the stopwatch on my iPhone. We also try to mute our mics at when we're not speaking. Very good. Go ahead. Uh, good morning. My name is Keith Courier, and I represent the plaintiff appellant in this matter, Montavious Finley, and I'd like to reserve five minutes in rebuttal, please. Okay. We'll put 15 minutes on. Thank you. Our statutes here basically provide us with a roadmap for which to follow in this analysis, Your Honors, and those statutes are 38A-371, 38A-336, 38A-334, and 38A-364. Mr. Courier, Attorney Courier, how do you get into those um, provisions? As I read the trial court's memorandum of decision, it engaged in a choice of law analysis, and it found that Tennessee law applies. And then as an alternate ground for rendering judgment for the defendant, it concluded that even if Connecticut law applied, you still could not prevail. Do you agree that's kind of the, that was the trial court's approach? Yes, that was. Okay. Where in your brief do you argue the choice of law issue? Um, I quite frankly, I, I, I did not, Your Honor, argue the choice of law issue. It, I don't okay, think what? it was ever. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. It never was a choice of law issue. And Yes, I, I probably should have addressed that very, very briefly in my brief. It was but not if you raised. Don't, if you don't attack on appeal the principal ground upon which the trial court relied, how can you prevail in the appeal? Well, the principal ground should be an, an analysis of the statutes here in the state of Connecticut. It was never a choice of law issue, Your Honor. Well, well but okay, okay, but you don't argue that in your brief. You don't argue that, is, that the trial court somehow committed error by seeing this as a choice of law issue. That is correct, Your Honor. Isn't that, plain, isn't that fatal to your appeal? I don't think so, because I think it's a plain error, Your Honor, that this is an interpretation but, of a Connecticut. But you haven't raised plain error in your brief. That is correct, Your Honor. I think what this comes down to is it's it's an interpretation of Connecticut statutes here, Your Honor. Um, the issue of choice of law was never raised in the trial court by any of us. It was raised by the judge. And yes, Your Honor, it is not addressed in my briefs. Um, this is not a choice between Connecticut 
and Tennessee law. It's, a, it's an interpretation of a Connecticut statute here and several Connecticut statutes, Your Honor. And I think the principal statute here is 38A371, which sets forth mandatory security requirements that we are to follow here in the state of Connecticut for any vehicle traveling on the roadways here in the state of Connecticut, whether it's registered here in the state of Connecticut or just passing through. And that statute clearly gives um, the, the state and the insurance commissioner the ability to regulate vehicles that are traveling through our state, even if they're not registered here. Um, and that specifically applies to the defendant's vehicle in this case. It was traveling through the state and was not registered here. The next step in this analysis is 38A336, which very clearly and unequivocally states that all vehicles must have uninsured motorist coverage when they're operating in the state of Connecticut here. So that was a statute debated by the legislature, cited in my brief with the um, legislative history. Um, they made it a clear policy choice to have uninsured motorist coverage for vehicles in the state of Connecticut. Now, 336 says that these, uh, these regulations and statutes should be adopted pursuant to 334. And 334 is the minimum provisions in automobile insurance policies. So this is basically an, an enabling statute. It gives the commissioner the power to set regulations to govern vehicles traveling on our roadways. Now, 334 on its face applies to motor vehicles with a commercial registration which is the case here, the, the defendant's motor vehicle. The crux of really kind of the argument in this case is that last phrase in that statute that says registered or principally garaged in this state. So um, when you look at that one piece of language in conjunction with the other statutes in accordance with the plain meaning statute, statute uh, section 1-2Z, they all have to be read together, read together. It's a clear mandate of our legislature that we have uninsured motorist, uninsured motorist coverage for vehicles operating in the state of Connecticut and on our roadways. So the last two sections that I mentioned, 334 and 363, define what a private passenger motor vehicle is because that's where the statutes apply to private passenger motor vehicles. Um, in both of those statutes, they state they clearly apply to a commercial motor vehicle, such as this case. And then when the private passenger motor vehicle is defined, it's defined as a vehicle with a commercial registration. So there is no doubt that these statutes apply to the defendant's vehicle. There's no doubt it was the legislature's intention and the law states that we have to have uninsured motor vehicle coverage, coverage on vehicles, that all vehicles traveling through the state of Connecticut must have that coverage. Now, if there was any ambiguity because of that last sentence in Section 38334, registered or principally garage in this state, then we can look to the legislative history and the public policy in the state of Connecticut. And the state of Connecticut has made it very clear that it, it's their public policy, it's our public policy, to maintain insurance for those who would otherwise be uninsured. And that is reflected in Tanone, as cited in my brief, Your Honor. And Tanone specifically states, our state has consistently maintained a strong public policy favoring uninsured motorist coverage. It further states that the legislature and this court have a well-established and deliberate policy of favoring ensuring the risk of loss resulting from the uninsured and uninsured motorists. So it's clearly the public policy, a strong public policy in this state that we have uninsured motorist coverage for people who are in the exact position as Mr. Finley was. He was injured and there was no insurance coverage to remedy his injuries. So this is also um, extended and explained by the legislative history that was included in my brief and in my appendix when they were debating um, 338A336. And again, it's clear that the legislature intended there when they created this statute, creating uninsured motorist coverage, that they intended that this be provided to all residents, all people who are traveling through this state, so that they would have a remedy when they were injured for by, by the negligence of uh, somebody who did not choose to have insurance. So I think the statute set forth the roadmap on this case of where we should go with this. They set forth the legislature's intent. 
And that intent clearly um, manifests itself and is, is congruous with the public policy of the state of Connecticut. And if there are no further questions, I will rely upon my brief for the remainder of my argument. You have five minutes rebuttal time if you wish to use it. Council, Attorney Bowerman. Uh, good morning, Your Honors. I'm Richard Bowerman, representing Western Express and National Casualty Company. What the plaintiff wants this court to do is to ignore the statute, the clear statute, which is the authorizing statute for the Commissioner on Insurance of Connecticut to adopt certain regulations which will have this law. And that statute is 38A334, which requires that the minimum provisions in automobile liability policies for, for vehicles registered or garaged in the state. My papers submitted to the court outline why, in fact, that argument should fail. I found particularly interesting and, frankly, a more interesting discussion if we have a discussion of let's assume the court agrees with the plaintiff. For example, in its brief, the plaintiff states that the court may conclude in order to bring the language of the Connecticut statutes and clear public policy of Connecticut into harmony, it is reasonable to interpret the language of 38A334 as a recognition by the General Assembly that most other states have their own statutory law providing for some sort of mandatory underinsured or uninsured coverages. First, I don't know what the basis for that position is. I can't represent to this court that I have done a 50 state jurisdiction review of each state's uninsured motorist coverage or uninsured motorist coverage laws. I simply Googled it and found out that the minority of states actually require uninsured and even fewer states require underinsured. underinsured. Um, and we would have a situation here in a highly regulated industry such as the automobile liability business where you have, for example, fleet coverages and other consequences where a commissioner of any state, whether it be Connecticut or any other jurisdiction, is going to enact laws that in essence would require every jurisdiction to comply with that law. In this case, for example, Mr. Finley was one of our drivers who was involved in an accident in Connecticut. He brought and was injured. He had a workers' compensation claim and was compensated. So when you get into the issues of commercial vehicles, fleet policies, which clearly our statutory scheme excludes, you're getting into areas where were I the Commissioner of Insurance, I would have public hearings and want to determine what type of regulations, if any, I would apply under those circumstances. For example, you get situations where some states permit stacking, others don't. There are so many nuances and complexities that require further analysis when you get into a context of beyond private passenger vehicles, which is what Section 331 of our statute requires, not commercial vehicles, not fleet policy vehicles. So I think we go down a road uh, if we simply ignore what I believe is the clear statutory scheme that it has to be principally garaged or, or, or registered in the state. If you're simply going to ignore the authorizing statute and take that limitation away where a commissioner of Connecticut can, he or she, make any kind of regulation that would affect every jurisdiction. Uh, it, 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 it would present, I think, a regulatory scheme that is not permitted by our statute. You have to ignore the clear reading of our statutes. To me, it's just too tortured an analysis. I've set it forth in my papers. Uh, we've cited the case, the cases uh, that support our position. Frankly, I think Judge Peck's analysis was spot on. It's hard for me to argue better than that. Happy to answer any questions, Your Honor. 
I see no questions. Attorney Bowerman, Attorney Courier, would you like to reserve, use your rebuttal time? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, these statutes, as I mentioned, have to be read in conjunction with 1-2Z to give them any kind of sense. If you adopt the appellee's argument here and you hyper-focus, as uh, the trial court did, on the language registered or principally garaged in this state, then you're saying the insurance commissioner has no power to regulate any vehicles who aren't registered here in the state of Connecticut. So any vehicle can drive through the state of Connecticut without any kind of insurance, with no consequences, and the insurance commissioner in the state of Connecticut would have no power over them whatsoever, whether it's uninsured motorist coverage or basic liability coverage. Um, I think that would frustrate the entirety of Section 700, Chapter 700, um, and our insurance regulations here in the state of Connecticut. Okay. Uh, I see no further questions from the judges, so we will conclude uh, this second appeal. Thank you very much to both counsel for joining us. Thank you, Your Honor. Have a good day.